Good afternoon. It's the press conference of the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation, Mr. Lavrov, with the question. And please, United Nations Correspondent Association, take the floor. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone who continues to show interest towards the, the Russian foreign policy to our work at the United Nations. We wanted to start away with a Q&A session. They're still uh, writing again that I'm speaking Russian, surprisingly. We wanted to kick off with a Q&A session, but I'm, I have to start with yet another fact of the use of the terrorist methods by the Kiev regime. On the morning of the uh, January 24th, Moscow time, a terrorist attack was conducted as a result in the Belgorod region a Russian transport aircraft Il-76 was downed. It was supposed to transport from the uh, Moscow region to Belgorod of six, 65 military servicemen of the armed forces of Ukraine. The, they were accompanied by three Russian officers and the crew of six people. All of them died. The Ukrainian prisoners of war were transported to the Belgorod region in order to conduct yet another swap that was agreed between Moscow and Kiev. Instead of this, the Ukrainian side launched um, an air, aircraft, um, air, air defense missile from the um, Kharkov region. Um, it targeted the the airplane and was a fatal strike. We've asked for an emergency session of the Security Council at 3 p.m. New York time. And we really expect that the French German ship will do their, uh, will execute their mandate bona fide and will schedule this as soon as possible. We do not want to repeat the situation of April 2022 when after the staging of of Bucha, where the bodies of people were shown, and we still cannot get their names. After that staged action, the British chairmanship that was at the helm of the Security Council in April denied calling such a session for 72 hours. I hope that our French colleague will not follow the same path and will call an emergency session as we have asked today at 3 p.m. Mr. Foreign Minister, for this press conference on behalf of uh, the UN Correspondent Association, Valeria Robeco from Ansa Newswire. Uh, my question is uh, on the Middle East. Uh, most of the world uh, agrees uh, that the two-state solution is the only way forward uh, uh, for the peace between uh, Israeli and Palestinians. In your conversation here in New York, uh, uh, did you have the idea that there is a chance for a, cons uh, a concerted effort uh, uh, between all parties, uh, Israel included, uh, on the two-state solution, and uh, in what time frame uh, could such discussions be started? And which options are on the table if uh, Premier Netanyahu continues to oppose to this uh, uh, possibility? Thank you so much. Yesterday, there was a thorough discussion at the U UN Security Council. I think uh, there is continued session, and more than 70 delegates are to speak there. There is no other way than to deliver on the decision of the Security Council and General Assembly on the creation of the Palestinian state, as well as the principles that were endorsed by everyone back in the day. I mean the borders of 1967 with the capital in East Jerusalem, as well as ensuring the viability of the Palestinian state that could safely and securely coexist peacefully with Israel and the rest other regional nations. If yet again, after such a task was first formulated back in the, at the end of the 1940s and 
for many decades, this task, his obligation to create the Palestinian state, has been dragged out with words and was trying to bury it in half-hearted initiatives. If that situation repeats again, we'll reap the fruit of yet another conflict, yet another explosion of violence. And I think that the majority of the UN members understand that. I've met with many Arab countries. I've just had a big meeting with all the um, permanent ambassadors, representatives of the Organization for Islamic Cooperation. They're um, very resolute in their intention that an official decision should be made about the creation of the Palestinian state. And negotiations should start that should be accompanied by neutral and effective mediators. Unfortunately, the Middle Eastern Quartet exists no longer. The United States have done everything in their power to thwart its efforts, saying that they'll do it single-handedly, the mediation. I mean, uh, what it led to, we all know fully well. And naturally, be very resolute for the initiative in creating such a mediation mechanism that would prepare, ideally, an international conference on the Palestinian issue. Such initiative should be taken on by the regional countries, first and foremost, the League of Arab States representatives. Well, the first step, I've, I've spoken about that yesterday, and today was, we spoke about it with the Islamic Cooperation Organization representatives. It seems absolutely necessary to make an effort to rebuild the Palestinian unity for all Palestinian factions and all those who are working with them from abroad for them to, to get together and to rebuild, to announce the rebuilding of the unity of the Palestinian unity as a important foundation for the future Palestinian states. Without that, all mechanisms that uh, you have mentioned that have been discussed in the back rooms, there they won't be viable. They uh, would only be aimed at creating a seeming change in, in the Gaza Strip without unification with the Western Bank. Without that, bringing back together the disunited Palestinian side, broken apart, they would be just trying to spend time. And naturally, we're very worried about the statement by the Israeli PM that the, they're not talking about creating the Palestinian state. Since that, in any case, the settlement is possible only through the process of negotiations, we expect that those who have an influence on the Israeli side, more influence than uh, we have, for example. They will deliver on their function and ensure participation of Israel in good faith in the negotiation process, and we'll try to achieve that. Tas, please. Good afternoon, Minister. I have two questions for you. Going back to the terrible situation with Il-76, what do you think? Did Kiev do that deliberately? What were the goals of Ukraine when they conducted such terrorist attacks and actions? Second question is about the situation in the Middle East. Many journalists trying to find answers, how could this happen? Was it possible that the U.S. did not know about the prepared attack by Hamas, since it was prepared for, you know, for a year and with heavy weapons? What kind of thoughts do you have about that, and what do you think? In general, this is, what's the projection of the Middle Eastern situation on the U.S. politics in the upcoming election? As for the question about the downed military transportation aircraft Il-76 and about the reasons behind the Ukrainian criminal act. We're trying to find out the facts right now. The first reports that we, we've we seen with that, that right away after the aircraft was downed, after the uh, shelling from the anti-aircraft, with the anti-aircraft missiles, the Ukrainian side mentioned yet again their uh, victory of the victorious Ukrainian armed forces, but when they found out, that, that when it became known that it was a, a POW swap plane and a, the Ukrainian officials from the military 
ministry could not not know about this swap. Right away, the Ukrainian propaganda started to sweep it under the carpet, such um, overly emphatic notions of their victory. And they're trying to find other explanations. Yet again, we're just getting the information. It's been rechecked. And for that, we're also insisting on the calling of the Security Council session where the Ukrainian side could tell us um, how it all happened. As for the situation in the Gaza Strip and those crisis trends that we've seen, indeed we spoke a lot about with all of my counterparts and in Moscow as well when the greater delegation of the League of Arab States and Organization for Islamic Cooperation traveled there. When we were discussing the way it all exploded, you probably remember two weeks before the 7th of October, Jake Sullivan gave an interview and said that the situation in the Middle East has never been so peaceful and calm for the last 20 years. Such words were said. In regard to whether the U.S. side knew about it, whether they had any, any signals about it, there are a lot of conspiracy theories, and you possibly remember the terrorist attack that we have condemned within Israel. There, were, there was a lot of talk saying that the Israeli special services and intelligence services did know about it. They couldn't help but know it. And there, there were conversations that the United States, that were following through satellites every corner of the world, and especially they were closely following the Middle Eastern region, they couldn't help but notice the movement of a tremendous amount of people, equipment, drones. They were being prepared to conduct the terrorist attack. I hear the same thing that you're hearing. Such discussions become public, but we've seen no proof, and I wouldn't want to speculate about whether that is true or not. Welcome back. Uh, Sherman Briceby, South African Broadcasting. What is Russia's position in regards to South Africa's uh, case at the International Court of Justice uh, accusing Israel of acts of genocide uh, in this war in Gaza? Well, we... <laughs> well, we expect that the International Court of Justice will execute its functions, as you know. Ukraine is accusing Russia of violating the Genocide Convention. It has also applied to the International Court of Justice about 40 Western countries in the violation of all precedent um, um, are on the side of the Ukraine. This process will be extremely politicized. There is no doubt about it. Well, we know that all Judges should be unbiased, except for possibly the International Criminal Court. They have their own rules. The, the International Court of Justice always enjoyed a very high standing, and we hope that it will follow the letter of the international law, including the international humanitarian law. And as you know, we do not interfere in the legal system in this way. I remembered in this regard that Quite recently, Secretary Blinken was in the Middle East. He was asked the same question. He said that the Israelis' um, case um, against Israel due to, to the International Court of Justice is distracting the attention of the global community from the settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. If that is indeed so, the attention is being paid, but it's been put a, distracted. We, we don't see any attention from the United States except for an attempt to drag out the situation, not to allow to any decisions by the United Nations Security Council and on 
on stopping that. But in the, in, we see an attempt to use um, a wording that gives a carte blanche to it's a collective punishment of the Palestinians. We'll see what happens. The court has its own obligations, its own statute, and all the obligations are written out there. Excuse me. The, I'm sorry. The third drawer, Evelyn Leopold. Please. Okay. Thank you, Marsha. Um, you have moved tactical nuclear weapons into Belarus. Um, do you intend to use them in Ukraine? Well, it takes a long time for the information to travel to you. It happened six months ago. It was all explained by President Putin, President of Belarus. It was said from the very beginning that considering the, the measures by the United States and their allies, the measures on modernization of the nuclear arsenal, that in the violation um, is, is using in nuclear sharing in the violation of the non-proliferation treaty and considering that the servicemen of these five countries have been taught how to use these tactical nuclear weapons, considering that for many years when the U.S. tried to raise the topic of tactical nuclear weapons and to put it at the center of our strategic stability discussions, they were trying to achieve the situation where all of the tactical weapons of the United States was returned to the territory of the U.S. simply for the fact that it's, it's been deployed in Europe is strategic for us. It's right next to our borders. But they denied to do that vehemently. And we said that since they're updating their arsenals of tactical nuclear weapons, we cannot be fully aware, we cannot fully understand why it is being done. So yet again, considering that they're denying and refusing to bring back these weapons on, to their own territory, upon the request of the President of Belarus, we will transfer part of our tactical nuclear weapons to be situated on the territory of the Belarus Republic. Everyone knew about that. Naturally, the West tried to um, to be a bit hysterical about it, saying that they can do it, but we can't. So all the possibilities to avoid the escalation were not used by the U.S. All of the uh, treaties were torpedoed and they refused to bring back their tactical nuclear weapons and to put it in compliance with an NPT treaty while well, it's still not been violated. There's no evidence that the United States has deployed tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine or Belarus. What was that? Can I you said, repeat? Why? There's no evidence that the United States is deploying tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine or Belarus. It's only Russia to this point. <laughs> if we, I did not say that the United States are placing their, situating the weapons in Ukraine. Well, for many years, they're holding their nuclear weapons on the territory of five NATO member countries. And the citizens of these countries are being taught how to use these nuclear weapons. That's what I said. That's what I've said. If this logic seems wrong to you. Well, I already mentioned the mentality of our American and Anglo-Saxon and other Western colleagues. They believe that they can do anything. Why does Russia is agreeing with Belarus about something? Well, they're not democratic countries. This is a sad mentality. It will soon stand in the way of the development of, of humanity cannot always survive on the neo-colonial approach and using neo-colonial practices 
I can do everything and you're banned from doing it. Um, Minister, good day to you. Uh, this is Pratiksha Gildayal from the BBC. Uh, my question to you is, what evidence is Russia planning to present that there were indeed prisoners of war on that plane that was downed? Um, and do you worry that no one will believe you? What is that? And do you worry that the international community may not believe you unless you present evidence of war? Don't, I have no concern about the international community not believing us. As I've already mentioned, the international community, through Western representatives and media outlets, has already proven its the fact that its position has highly been discredited completely. So, for example, I'm not trying to cast doubt on anything. There was a mention made today about Bucha. And in early April in 2022, there were images by, from, by your colleagues from the BBC uh, showed of a central street in the city of Bucha, where three days ago a Russian military personnel withdrew from, and the mayor of the city uh, restored his authority. The city made this announcement, and three days later, suddenly, the BBC shows images on the central uh, uh, street, the corpses of people, and soon it will be two years since we have requested, and there were allegations, accusations against us in position of further sanctions. Soon will be the second anniversary of us asking at least for the uh, family, for the, the last names of the people to be provided, those last names of those cor people whose corpses were depicted in BBC uh, reports. I did not interrupt you. I did not interrupt you. The BBC, as the author of this sensationalism, could perhaps uh, look into the bottom, uh, get to the bottom of this, the truth of what happened. So as for whether the international community, the international community believes us, as uh, you assuming the West, of course the Anglo-Saxons is what you're implying, we're not too concerned about that. The uh, truth is jarring here, so they are constantly avoiding a frank response uh, uh, discussion and frank responses to direct questions. And it's also, since we're talking about the BBC and uh, the point of its location, this also applies uh, to the poisoning in Salisbury. We still have not received a single response to 46, I believe, or 45 official requests through the general prosecutor's office of, to which uh, the uh, British royal authorities have an obligation to respond to in line with both international conventions and bilateral conventions as well. So for that case, could you kindly ask the Ukrainians your Ukrainian colleagues, you would ask them, they probably already learned something from their representatives from afar. I cannot make any promises about uh, the Ukrainians recognizing what happened, but they are aware that there were military personnel, and that's for certain. Whether or not you believe this, well, with all due respect to the BBC, I am not too concerned about that. Excuse me, BBC colleague. Keep calm and enjoy the answer, please. Hi, Minister. This is Shri Deji, China Central Television. Uh, you mentioned a lot about your uh, U.S. colleagues' words and actions on Middle East. Um, given the fact that the Israeli government has rejected two-state solution clearly and repeatedly last week, do, do, you think how, do you think U.S. still have the influence for East, to push Israel for a ceasefire or two-state solution? And what do you think, how, how much uh, does the U.S. foreign policy on Middle East contributes to current situation in Middle East? Thank you. I'm not in a position to uh, to discuss the topic of how relations are shaped between the United States and Israel. This is a matter of their bilateral contacts. Oh, the only thing I can do is to confirm that, like the majority of those present here, we have been reading the reports from U.S. media outlets about how there is a dispute here within the administration, uh, a dispute about how to make uh, Israel more constructively minded. Uh, but I don't know how this will conclude. There is a president. There are national security advi There's a national security advisor. There's the secretary of state. Uh, a large number of deputies. I don't know what, how to respond and to what degree. 
all this uh, speculation is accurate. I won't dwell on that. But as for the present crisis, the repercussions of a U.S. policy in the region, I believe, are viewed and understood as, uh, uniformly by everybody. And that's not a single misadventure over the past decades that was undertaken by Washington with a reference to they invoked the, their fundamental security as concerns 10,000 miles across the Atlantic, uh, po apparently risks the security repose. Not a single of these misadventures resulted in a situation where a country that was fell under attack began to live uh, with more prosperity in better ways. Many states no longer exist. For example, Libya, its statehood has been completely destroyed. Iraq, everybody is aware of the shameful conduct of U.S. Uh, diplomacy in their attempt to justify this aggression, uh, uh, the, which completely failed uh, with their so-called material evidence. And after the invasion into Iraq, the Islamic State emerged when the United States disbanded all of the structures from the Ba'ath Party, including the army, the officers, Saddam Hussein's officers, in order to maintain the that safeguard the possibility of maintaining livelihoods for their families, en masse, they joined the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. And they comprise the nucleus of this. And the same applies to Al-Qaeda, incidentally. Not long before this, the Al-Qaeda emerged as a result of the U.S.'s invasion into Afghanistan. Like the invasion into Syria, this also spawned Jabhat al-Nusra, which is now called Hirat Tahrir al-Sham. And we are aware, for example, of the fact that in Syria, those bases where the U.S. illegitimately established in the east of the country, where they are attempting to establish some kind of a quasi-state of the courts, thereby establishing expl uh, explosive problems at the region regional scale they, uh, scale, they continue to maintain contacts with certain fighters of the Islamic State who carry out recovery efforts, rehabilitation there, their training there, following the instructions of their U.S. handlers. They are participating in a host of operations and terrorist acts that are far beyond the Middle East. So the influence of the United States on the Middle East as you, uh, the, the, they, they, they say, we'll deal with this ourselves. And the same with Palestine-Israel conflict. Uh, they uh, ended the quartet. They disbanded the quartet of the Middle East mediators, and they took everything into their own hands. We see what this resulted in. This is just another example of a situation where, as a result of the U.S. leadership, we see tragedy take place. Mr. Thank you very much for your time and for this press briefing. I'm here. I'm Vusala from Azerbaijan News Agency Report. Uh, so my question is about how do you assess the normalization process between Azerbaijan and Armenia? And uh, also, will Russian peacekeepers leave the Karabakh region of Azerbaijan in 2025 uh, as defined in the trilateral agreement of the November 2020? Thank you. No. Well, we, or rather President Putin personally, played a decisive role in the way that the war was stopped in November 2020 and in uh, the agreement that was reached. A number of trilateral documents was, were uh, achieved at the, at the uh, senior level, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and the Russian Federation. These documents determine the key parameters for the resolution including questions of border delimitation, the unblocking of trade and transport routes, as well as the signing of a peace agreement. The relevant structures were established at the vice premier minister of the, the three countries uh, who are dealing with the economic side of the question. Recently, we have been observing how after these agreements were reached, Western colleagues decided to 
incorrect, that it apparently was incorrect that the Russian Federation was attempting to achieve progress on that track. So what they began to do was to lure the Armenians and Azeris, either P Brussels, Paris, Washington, or to Prague, to bring them in. And incidentally, in Prague in the year 2022, Prime Minister Pashinyan uh, signed a document, and this document stipulates that he recognizes the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan within the 1991 borders. This means that Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous uh, Oblast, as it was called, uh, Karabakh there, constitutes an integral part of Azerbaijan. This was a surprise to us because prior to this, discussions focused on various options for a, a settlement to the question of the status of Karabakh, but uh, Armenia did this single-handedly. And since then, the question of status of uh, Karabakh has been closed. And yes, there are peacekeepers who remain there even after everybody recognized Karabakh as part of Azerbaijani territory, but this question no longer applies to the Armenian side. This is a matter of bilateral relations between the Russian Federation and Azerbaijan. The presidents discussed this matter. They agreed that at the present juncture, the presence of Russian peacekeepers is playing a positive role in order to reinforce stability, to build trust in the confidence in the region and to help facilitate the return of those residents of Karabakh who will wish to do so. Yes, thank you. Uh, Joseph Klein, Canada Free Press. Israel has, has recently proposed a two-month ceasefire in exchange for the release of all hostages, uh, but Hamas has flatly rejected this proposal. Moreover, uh, you mentioned uh, and, and criticized uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu for uh, his negative comments uh, and apparent rejection of the two-state solution. But just yesterday or the day before, a Hamas leader also flatly rejected a two-state solution with what they called a, a, quote, Zionist entity. And in their charter, uh, they call for the destruction of the Jewish state. So I'd like your comments on that. Thank you. Well, when it comes to those proposals that have been advanced, uh, uh, let's stop for two weeks or stop for two months. You will return hostages to us. And the other side says, well, we'll return them, but not all of the hostages. This is a trade that is ongoing, and it distracts attention from the essence of the problem. The essence, the substance, needs to be an immediate ceasefire. One can discuss at great length uh, that Hamas does not recognize the Israeli statehood, Jewish statehood, and thereby, thereby justifies the ongoing bass slaughter in Gaza. If we are to only draw attention to the surface of what is transpiring to individual manifestations, and if we fail to see what's going on over the horizon, where there needs to be the establishment of the Palestinian state, these kinds of incidents will continue to erupt throughout and specifically because we are keen to achieve a long-term solution, we are insist, uh, focusing not just on the promise of beginning discussions to establish a state of Palestine, but we are insisting on these steps at the practical level being taken and for there to be a clear timeline as to when they will result in the, 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 the stipulation set out in Security Council and General Assembly resolutions. And the first step in that direction, I mentioned this yesterday, I mentioned this today as well during the meeting with the Muslim countries, the first step needs to be the restoration of Palestinian unity. They themselves need to determine which principles will establish the basis for the restoration of the unity of their people because absent unity of the Palestinian people, there will be no bedrock foundation for the Palestinian state and what will be uh, maintained are only pretexts to keep Gaza separately in some kind of special status where somebody will ensure security, where there will be buffer zones, and to keep the West Bank also separately continuing it to keep this as like a colander 
uh, with uh, illegitimate settlements and thereby casting doubt on the notion itself of an independent Palestinian state. These are the details that need to be paid attention to. And as for Hamas's statements, there are a large number of them. Have you read the statements from the commanders? Uh, the Tzachal commanders, IDF commanders, that the Palestinians are animals, that uh, they cannot be viewed as being among civilized people. These are commanders. I believe the uh, chief of staff of the army and a number of ministers made such comments that every resident of Gaza uh, 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 when they reach the age of three, immediately automatically becomes an extremist because it, hatred towards Israel is cultivated there, regardless of what this process is called. But when, uh, for more than 70 years, you are not granted uh, uh, the, pro the, the state that is promised to you, what do you think is being taught in schools, in kindergartens? What is being told to ch uh, children in kindergarten for the third consecutive uh, 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 generation, there is an injustice there. And I spoke with my Israeli colleagues, and I stead, stated that the fact that the problem of the establishment of a of Palestinian state, the fact that this has not been resolved, this is the single most significant factor that results in the recruitment of extremists into the ranks of various organizations. They were insulted at that time at this statement, but I continue to believe that this is true. If we let this opportunity slide by, if we let this uh, slip where everybody is observing what is taking place and they're concerned about this, and if we fail to advance a solution that r upholds the interests of the Palestinians, they're uh, having a viable uh, state, and at the same time to uphold Israeli security interests, this is a key component of the challenge, then we will miss a very rare historic opportunity. Sergei Viktorovich, I have two questions. The first is building upon the, qu the response to the Palestinian, Palestinian settlement. Does the international community remember how these emer organizations emerged, like Hamas? How do they emerge? And the second has to do with the state of Russian-U.S. relations. What is your assessment of their level? What, at what stage are they at present? And are there prospects of them being completely frozen? And what will this ultimately be determined by? The low level is low. The point here is we're at a low point. There are virtually no contacts, with the exception of uh, discussions of the conditions for the operation of our diplomatic missions in the United States and the work of uh, their diplomats in the Russian Federation. And here, too, there are a great number of attempts to uh, secure one-sided advantages, attempts to accuse us of certain steps, even though they're perfectly aware of the fact that the current, uh, whole current uh, history with the diplomatic, diplomatic presence began with the decision taken by Obama in December of uh, 2016, the decision three weeks before Trump's inauguration, the Democratic administration left this little present here, and they expelled uh, uh, 120 of our people from Washington with their families, and uh, in an American noble way, the date on the date that they had to fly out to Russia, and they did this such that there was no direct flight from Washington to Moscow. Very humane here. Uh, these people are with children, including small children, on buses. As more than six hours, they traveled by bus to New York with their families in order to sit on a plane that flies to Moscow. This is, uh, uh, in a, this is, this is not becoming of adults, and for a long time, uh, we didn't respond because uh, when the, uh, Donald Trump inaugur was inaugurated, took up the oath, they, they were outraged at this approach taken by the Democrats, and we said that if you're able to redress the situation, let's wait and see, and they were unable to do this, and so then uh, in the summer we apologized. Nobody canceled the principle of reciprocity, otherwise uh, the country would simply not be respected, and we reacted in a reciprocal way, requesting that the same number of U.S. diplomats leave Russia. So. 
The Americans are champions of cancel culture. They canceled what Obama did, and all of the current discussions, uh, beginning with uh, uh, 2017, our people were expelled, and we did this in as a reciprocal step. So it's not really honest the way that they operate. And the first question had to do with Hamas and the history with the, uh, the emergence of these organizations. We discussed with representatives of the Islamic or the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They remember well how all of this happened, the way that Hamas was being used in order to resist the Fatha in Ramallah and in order to balance out and through Hamas. I won't dwell into, uh, delve into the details here, uh, but what's interesting is that in 2006, when elections were being prepared in Palestine, I re remember I spoke with Condoleezza Rice and our assessment of the situation was that perhaps it is better to advise the uh, Palestinians to delay the elections for a little bit because uh, when one considered the sentiment in Gaza and the West Bank, it was evident that there was an, a, a sharp uptick in the popularity of those with radical positions, including Hamas specifically, and Condoleezza and, uh, Rice said to me, no, 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 this is how democracy works. And just recently, Hillary Clinton remembered that period and said we should not have consented to the conduct of elections following which Hamas won. And since we agree, if we agreed, since we agreed, it was incumbent upon us to do everything possible for those who we needed to win. And that's also on the question of the democratic structure of the world and those countries to which uh, Americans pay attention. Is it possible that there'll be a reset in relations, a thawing of relations? Well, no. There are some very tedious discussions underway, back and forth, myriad proposals about how the diplomatic missions should work, how many security, what's the security detail of the U.S. ambassador, what it should be. We seem to need fewer security officials for our ambassadors. So, it's, it's difficult to believe that these are the topics we're discussing. And one more topic that comes up from time to time is uh, the Americans reminding us that the, there is a new START agreement and that Russia has frozen its uh, implementation. Let's resume this work. We've told them time and time again that it says in the agreement that it's been agreed and it's underpinned by the principle of indivisible security, equal rights, and mutual respect, and everything else, including inspections of nuclear sites. All of that stems from those principles. But the principles have been trampled into the ground by the Americans. And yet, uh, you know, they put it simply, they say, no, that's, that's something entirely different. The fact that we're practically at war with you over Ukraine, the fact that some people have called you enemies. Someone, in fact, actually said Russia is an enemy. Also, the fact that we're pitting, we've pitted practically all of Europe against you, just like back in the day, Napoleon pitted all of Europe, gathered all of Europe uh, under his flag to combat Russia. Hitler did the same, bringing together a lot of powers under the Wehrmacht to combat Russia. And uh, now we have Zelensky espousing Nazi ideology. They're trying to make sure that everyone toes the line in their position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But I had a press conference roughly 10 days ago, and I had a question put to me about this. Was there a response to the unofficial U.S. request, a request for strategic dialogue on this? And uh, we did respond in January. We expounded on our position. We don't have anything to say at this point. In terms of the types of weapons enshrined in the New START agreement, uh, we can discuss that, but there can't be any inspections, especially given the fact when we've had cases where our strategic sites have been shelled.
by long range weapons. The Ukrainians did that, weapons which couldn't have reached those sites without U.S. assistance, assistance to modernize them. So I'm sort of evading the question, if you will, but that is my answer. Thank you very much. What, what, what happened? There's too much COVID and, and other uh, bad bugs floating around New York. You are among friends. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It's always nice to see you in this room. Thank you for giving us this press conference. Mr. Foreign Minister, are you concerned that North Korea will no longer seek reunification with South Korea and are increasing tensions on the Korean Peninsula a concern for Moscow? And can you confirm that President Putin will visit the DPRK? A strange question, because our relationship with the DPRK is uh, proceeding nicely. It's developing quite actively. We see that the DPRK is trying to be independent, not to dance to anybody's tune. And we also see the US bringing together a new military bloc together with Japan and uh, South Korea. They're cobbling together this bloc and that bloc is building up military activity. It's creating large scale, it's conducting large scale exercises and the objective is clearly stated. They're preparing for war with the DPRK for years. We promoted the idea of establishing a security, a peace and security zone on the Korean Peninsula. This idea was enshrined as one of the goals of the so-called six-party talks. And then it was ignored Every time it came up, the Americans came up with some excuse. It's premature to discuss these kinds of agreements, arrangements. We need some more time to think. So it never really got off the ground. This group, which would discuss mutually acceptable security guarantees, confidence building measures, and so on and so forth. Having said that, the rhetoric we're currently hearing from South Korea this rhetoric all of a sudden became even more hostile towards Pyongyang. In Japan as well, we see, we hear aggressive rhetoric and they're seriously talking about in Japan of setting up, first of all, a mission and then infrastructure, NATO infrastructure. The U.S. are also sharing their infrastructure, setting up the infrastructure and then North Atlantic infrastructure there in Japan. They're also talking about the fact that uh, the U.K., Japan and the ROK are going to develop their cooperation. It's quite uh, wishy-washy the way they phrased it, but th they said something like nuclear-related co cooperation. And yes, Kim Jong-un made uh, the statement that he made. You see, the thing is, Netanyahu said that there will be no Palestinian state. Kim Jong-un said we're not going to unite with them, with the South Koreans. It's terrible when instead of unity, we have trends which divide us. And yet this is a systematic process across many regions. And the main contributor to that trend are those who believe uh, to be the masters of the universe. They think that uh, they ruled the earth for half a millennium, telling people how to live and that they're going to continue doing the same thing. This logic completely ignores the reality of the situation, which is objective. And that reality is the following. Former colonies, the overwhelming majority of these ex-colonies, have gained independence, they're now very much aware of their national interests. They want to buttress their national, their cultural identity. 
their religious identity as well. These ex-colonial states are developing, leaving the West behind. At least uh, that can be applied to the BRICS countries. So the ex-colonial powers have to face up to the reality in today's world. You shouldn't just think that you're so strong just because you have the dollar, you can strangle people with this dollar, you can disconnect people from the SWIFT system, or you can uh, reject applications for IMF loans. The list goes on. And this despite the fact that you imposed the system on the entire world. Back in the day, the world agreed. But then you became, well, you changed your position, became grossly abusive, abusing this mechanism. So if I'm very frank, if I put it simply, when we were kids, we'd go out to play outside after school. Perhaps you have similar memories of your own childhood. And there were, al there were always younger kids and the older kids. And what the older kids did is, well, uh, Sometimes some of them were hooligans, uh, they made fun of the little kids, and the little, little kids would get upset, but then they grew up fairly quickly, and then uh, they fixed the situation. RT. Um, at this point, we've got a major Western outlet, Bloomberg, that's running a headline saying that Europe should arm itself against the barbarians at its gate. And by barbarians, they are, of course, referring to Russia. Uh, we also have a number of Western leaders saying that they expect Russia to attack NATO uh, within the next five years. We have a number of Western leaders making that claim. Uh, do you think that this is uh, essentially the leaders of the Western countries trying to psych up their populations for some kind of all-out war against Russia, as that seems to be a recurring theme? We hear this rhetoric over and over. We hope that that will not be the case. We hope that there are some smart people left there, left in the room, people who are well versed not just in history, but who have uh, the instinct to protect themselves. I also heard Biden saying something similar, warning that if Ukraine loses the war, then Russia will march on the Baltic states, on Finland, and on other NATO members. Such statements were also made by lower level leaders, not just by US leaders. You see, I'm inclined to believe in reason, in the reasonableness of the US leadership. So I see this as an attempt to achieve short-term objectives, that is, allocating funds to Ukraine, dispersing funds to Ukraine. They think that they can uh, instill fear in the Congress with these fairy tales, with these concoctions. They hope that this will prompt Congress to compromise and give 60-odd billion to Ukraine as part of an aid package with some money going to Israel, some money as well to um, set up equipment around the border. I don't know. I think the people actually making these pronouncements, they understand themselves. They understand full well that these are, well, how should I put it? That it's hogwash. And President Putin, in fact, has commented on this narrative. He did this recently. You can look up that interview, listen to it. There's no need, there's no desire, political, military, economic, to attack anyone. We, ha we don't have that desire. There was no need for us to start a special military operation. We wouldn't have had the need to do that unless the West allowed for the coup d'etat in February of 2014, and it did, and then it gave the, um, the coup participants carte blanche. They immediately said that uh, Russia's, the, Russia, the status of the Russian language in Ukraine would be revoked. They proclaimed people living in the Donbass and the Crimea as terrorists because uh, they opposed the bloody anti-constitutional coup. Then a war was waged on the Donbass, 
and we did this because the Germans, the French, the Americans asked as well. They begged us to put stop this war, to sign the Minsk Accords, and they were in fact uh, signed just here at the Security Council in the Security Council chamber. They were signed unanimously, and then that would have worked had they been implemented. Everything would have worked out. But it turned out that uh, amongst the signatories, aside from President Putin, no one was prepared to do that, to recognize that. The special military operation became inevitable after many, many years, years throughout which we tried. We tried to convince the West that they shouldn't turn Ukraine into a direct threat on our borders not 10,000 miles away, like the U.S. used to say, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Yugoslavia. They said that these uh, states posed a threat to U.S. interests. But we're talking about a country that's bordering our country. It's not an ocean away. And uh, these lands, Russian people developed them throughout centuries. And the descendants of uh, these Russians live on these lands, and yet their descendants have been banned from speaking the Russian language. So it's a different situation. It's a shame that some are going down that road in Europe, that they're trying to ban Russian, ban Russian culture. It's unbecoming for those who proclaim themselves to be members of the EU, which they believe to be... Um, Thank you very much. Stefano Vaccara, La Voce in New York and, and the Ital Press. Uh, in Europe, there will be the election soon, the European election. Uh, does Russia expect that this could change the relationship, uh, something could change in um, favor of uh, Russia? And then also President, um, President, former President Trump, he said that if uh, he, he will uh, be back in the White House, he will resolve the wars in a matter of a de days. Now, do you uh, believe him that this is our, that he will be able to do that? You know, there are lots of things that happen, lots of statements, day in, day out. They're published, and we can ask the same question in relation to those. Do you believe them? Or don't you? And I don't really want to play that game. I can't believe something that is immaterial, that's intangible. Time will tell. We'll see. I doubt that the Ukrainians will be prepared to agree to any kind of settlement. Zelensky has been relatively rude when he commented Trump's comments. Well, that's Zelensky's style. And... Uh, in fact, uh, the entire leadership is somewhat uncouth. If you m might remember, Scholz, the Chancellor of uh, Germany, well, there were some untoward comments made uh, by the Ukrainian leadership vis-à-vis -vis Mr. Scholz. He called him liver sausage. They called him liver sausage. As for the European Parliament elections, are those the, the elections you're referring to, elections to the European Parliament? Well, this political body, um, I don't know it that well. From time to time, we hear russophobic statements, uh, decisions being adopted at the European Parliament. So I'm not particularly interested in I'm not following those elections. I think what's much more useful is trying to figure out which European countries are going to hold elections, and in those elections, which countries are trying to make sure that uh, European nations aren't going to be dissolved in this faceless machinery in Brussels. That's much more interesting, following that, than seeing who's going to agree, who's going to come up to, with what deal to be elected to the European Parliament. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Afrim Kosaifi from Arab News Daily. I'm here. Um, just a quick follow-up on your um, uh, response regarding the U.S.-Russia relationship. 
Um, I'm just wondering, in a world when the diplomatic channels between your two countries are cut off like that, how much damage and suffering do you think the rest of the world um, uh, suffers from it when there are no relationship between your two countries? And what, in your opinion, would it take uh, for Russia and the U.S. relationship to get back on some sort of a normal track? Thank you. Well, as for my concerns about the rest of the world suffering from the current situation in the U.S.-Russian relations, I don't know how to answer that. I'd like to ask you to to tell me what kind of satisfaction did the world receive from our normal relations, relatively normal relations with the U.S.? What was the pleasure in, in, in those relations? Well, in an abstract sense, um, isn't it great that they're talking to each other? Well, that's, that's the notion. If you don't specify what right now is happening and how the rest of the world is suffering from it, well, it seems that it can be said that many raise an alarm with the fact that there is greater escalation, military rhetoric. Possibly no one wants to have a, a big war. We have been through uh, big wars in our history multiple times. However, the actions are done by, by the U.S., the doctrinal documents of the United States, as well as NATO documents, have it enshrined that we are the main direct threat, and China is the main challenge on the next, in, in the next stage. They're using these uh, carefully worded formulas. Moreover, they're trying to engage neutral countries. Now Finland is in NATO. We don't know what it would gain from that. As for Sweden, the, the process is moving on. Yesterday I met with the foreign minister of Switzerland. He was trying to convince me that they can do as before. Now, they, they can be mediators in any process. And I tried to explain that a mediator must be unbiased and neutral. And Switzerland was famous for its military neutrality and in a wider sense of neutrality. That allowed it to be a successful capital of the UN in Geneva and to host different negotiation processes and with that to make its contribution to the peaceful development of the world and different regions. He said that we are still prepared to do that and we are at your service, as always. But I try to point out that right now they have a national security strategy. It has been yeah. already endorsed and it will um, date for 2024 till 2027. And this national strategy of Switzerland stipulates that Switzerland is prepared and has an interest in building European security not with Russia, but against Russia. There are such examples as well, um, something on a smaller scale than Russia-U.S. relations, but such examples I have just given to you, they reflect how systemic how um, the systemic actions of the main guarantor of the Western unity, that everyone is following the anti-Russian and Russophobic positions. And that's regrettable. Thank you very much. My name is Marian Schmickle. I'm with ARD German Television. And I was wondering whether you've had a chance in the last couple of days to meet up with uh, former President Donald Trump or with members of his campaign team. Have you already written an article about it? Thank God, because I haven't met with him. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, uh, Mr. Foreign Minister Lavrov. My question is regarding Indo-Russia relationships. Uh, just recently, uh, we heard that there has been an Eastern Maritime Corridor between the two sides, and I wanted to get your opinion on how Russia views the potential impact of the Eastern Maritime Corridor on the country's trade relations with India and also its broader economic interest in the Pacific region as well. Thank you. 
I think this is a question that requires a, a great answer, a, a, a big one, a detailed one. But we, as a, an overwhelming majority of the, on the Eurasian continent, have an interest in new corridors that would ensure, first and foremost, cheaper logistics, faster delivery of goods than it happens right now, or through the Suez Channel or around Africa. And number three, everyone has an interest in creation of logistic and transport chains that would not depend from the West. They will be independent of those who systematically abuse their position in global trade and global transportation routes. There is a north-south corridor that would allow to bring from the Baltic Sea um, goods um, efficiently, reliably to the Persian Gulf. There is a plan to connect ports of Russia in the Far East and India. There is also an initiative, Europe, Middle East, India. That's all. Uh, it's up to the Western Europeans. They're promoting this topic. For us, um, the priority is the north-south corridor, and uh, it will benefit India directly. It will go through Russia, Azerbaijan, Iran, and further down um, to India. And Pakistan has also an interest in that. Right now, there are plenty of discussions. Then the Northern Sea Route is of great interest to India and China. The Northern Sea Route, considering the global warming factor, and a promise that it will be very soon, very soon will be navigable all year round. It will compete with all other transportation routes, winning more time by one third compared to this West Channel. We've discussed that with the Indian colleagues, not through our ministry, but it's up to Ministry of Economics, uh, Finance, um, heads of government. But it's one of the main future tasks for our regional development. Spasiba. Um, my question is regarding Afghanistan. Recently, you mentioned the importance uh, of Taliban engaging with the National Resistance Front and also to establish uh, an inclusive, uh, inclusive government. I was wondering if you can um, elaborate on that statement that you made and um, also clarify the part about the engaging with the National Resistance um, Front. And also you met with um, a foreign minister of Iran, Amir Abdullahian, yesterday. Um, did you talk about uh, what is going on in the Red Sea and the Houthis? Um, if you can uh, also give us something on that. Yes, we have discussed it. There is an aggression taking place in, in the Red Sea, a direct illegal aggression in the violation of all principles of international law. The organizers of this aggression, they're lying when they're saying that this is self-defense in, in accordance with the UN Charter. Our mission in New York has uh, distributed yesterday or today, you quite possibly have it, they have distributed a document that uh, provides all the necessary arguments, the um, argumentation that was used by the UK and the US, and they're showing that this is just pillaging and not self-defense. As for Afghanistan, we've never evacuated our embassy in Kabul. It continues to function. We're keeping in touch with the Taliban. There are people who have the real power in the country. But we, as the rest of the UN members, do not officially recognize Taliban as they have taken upon themselves an obligation on, on several matters, including the respect for human rights, first and foremost, women and girls, also creating an inclusive government, inclusive in terms of ethnic background and other, because there are Uzbeks, Tajiks, Pushtu, Pashtuns, and Nazareans, but politically they're all Taliban. We're not ta talking about the ethnic composition, but we would like to have um, 
ethnic, religious inclusivity as well as political inclusivity. There was former President Hamid Karzai and uh, Chief uh, Administrator Abdullah Abdullah and other non-religious leaders who would like to stay in their country and they would like to help bring it back, put it back on track. And as you know, the U.S. don't give up um, the money of the others, $9 billion that could be used for to solve acute humanitarian and social matters in Afghanistan, but they pocketed $9 billion of Afghanistan's money and they don't explain it. As for the National Resistance Front, indeed, it acts in the north of Afghanistan. Their position does not give us hope that we'll be prepared to enter dialogue with Taliban, but uh, it should be strived for. They're all Afghanis and we're standing for it. However, for that, those who have an influence on the National Resistance Front, the National Salvation Front, they also need to encourage the peaceful approach, but not just take it as a given the continued military actions that happen from time to time. Thank you. Um, my name is Anas Asabar from Sky News Arabia. Two questions. The first one is, do you think the quartet on the Middle East is dead? And does Russia now playing an active effort to fix what happened recently? That's number one. Number two, there are multiple reports saying that the White House and the State Department and the Pentagon are discussion, in discussion to withdraw the U.S. forces from Syria. I don't know if you answered this before. But what, you, what is your comment on that? As for the quartet, I have commented on this topic in detail and here in New York as well. For many years, possibly starting from the point when the roadmap of Palestine-Israeli settlement was endorsed, it was many years ago, we, Russia, advocated for, for a fully-fledged membership of the League of Arab States in the Quartet. Because it, it, it seemed um, that it was half-colonial, U.S., Russia, EU, the U.N., and no one from represented the Arab countries, but, and it was about the Middle Eastern settlement. The only thing that was achieved was that the rest of the quartet members agreed to invite from time to time the representatives of the League of Arab States when the main discussion would have already been over and to simply inform them on what the senior partners have agreed upon, whether they have agreed on something. Right now, when I've mentioned the term that we have, we have an interest in, in a new effective mediation mechanism, I have already I have also noted that the leading role should be played by the regional countries. What I've taken from my multiple discussions with these countries, with Jordan, Qatar, Emirates and other colleagues, that they are prepared to take over such an initiative and to spearhead it. It would not be easy since the instincts die hard and the US instinct is to solve all the issue on their own and to tell everyone what they're supposed to do. That, for example, Mahmoud Abbas should appoint someone as a Gaza protector. These instincts are hard to get rid of. We have no issue, we have no discussions with the US on, on the Middle East. And here, Collective efforts in the support of, of the regional states would be quite in place. They would be well placed. But it was annihilated. And I think that the new mechanism should consist of the core from the regional countries, if they consider it reasonable to engage Russia, China, and other countries from outside. It will be up to them. It will be their decision. And I think that everyone would have to agree then to 
to work in lockstep and without launching some schemes in parallel that would distract attention from that. As for the withdrawal of um, the troops from Syria, well, that already happened once when Donald Trump, then the president, mentioned that they're leaving Syria. Right away, the, the leaders of Syrian democratic forces asked us and our military servicemen to help them establish connection with Damascus. In several days, the U.S. reconsidered and the representatives of the Syrian Democratic Forces and Kurds stopped asking for our facilitation of contacts with Damascus. They returned right away under the U.S. wing. It's not a matter of them withdrawing or not. They're illegally there, and those political forces among the Syrian Kurds who um, expect to have the U.S. Uh, um, umbrella and their their protection, they're uh, betting morally wrong. Thank you very much. Minister, I'm over here. This is Sharifa from Anadolu. Um, Pentagon has indicated a willingness to work with Turkey to move away from the state of conflict, and it's referring to Turkey invoking the Montreal Convention. And this has widely been understood as a desire to repeal the convention. What are your thoughts on this? And another question Who? is, is uh, no, no, no. President Putin... One second, one second. Who expressed interest? Pentagon. In... Pentagon. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a plan for President Putin um, to visit Turkey in the near future? Thank you so much. Uh, as for the Pentagon statement, as, as far as I understood it from your words, I, I haven't read it, but they said that they will try to get Turkey to um, change the the straight regime right now uh, when right now the military the military uh, ships are not to enter the Black Sea if they want to achieve that then our Turkish colleagues have told us multiple times that as protectors of the Montreux convention, they will strictly follow its provisions. I understand that the Pentagon, well, Lloyd Austin is back to work, right? That's why they're so active now. Well, I don't think that they will succeed. As for the visit to Turkey, I was asked about the visit to the DPRK. I can say that President Putin has an invitation from these two countries, from their leaders, and from many other foreign partners. The schedule is shaped by the Kremlin and his administration. Thank you very much. Yeah.